good morning. I don't know, did you guys grow up playing Oregon Trail on the computer? No? You guys, yeah, I got a couple people. Man, I, I died so many times of dysentery and trying to cross the river, I lost track. It didn't take much to die of dysentery, I feel like. And yet for Holden and Phoebe, Judson, it is something far greater than just playing a video game. They actually set out in 1853 on the Oregon Trail, some 2,000 miles across the country from Kansas City area all the way to the Washington Coast. And they, they had to do what every wagon train has to do. They had to pick a wagon captain. And they thought they were safe. They decided to pick the pastor. Mistake. The pastor early on made a decision. He said, listen, we never travel on Sunday." One couple heard the news, and they deserted. Phoebe was kicked off. She went in the wagon, and she screamed into a pillow. She debated and argued with the guy. He wouldn't budge. She was defeated. After all, her point was that they were traveling at oxen pace, 15 to 20 miles a day on good days, and far less on the mountain passes and the river crossings. But she was defeated, so they kept going. And on the first Sunday, they stopped all these other wagons, seemingly an endless number, passed them, and her frustration bubbled up again. She fumed. She argued. But she was defeated. They got that going on Monday, and on Tuesday, they got to the first river crossing, and there was a line for the ferry. One ferry, three days waiting. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They got back on the trail on Saturday and he announced again, we don't travel. And she was about to, to lose it. She was about to just go mad. She was yelling and arguing with the man, trying to reason, we have to go all the way across the continent. Please work with me here. But he wouldn't budge. She was defeated again. But it was a couple weeks into their travels that she started to notice on the side of the road were more and more carcasses of oxen, mule, and horses. And she admitted begrudgingly, maybe from time to time the animals needed a rest. A couple weeks later, watching the men mostly walk by the wagons, she relented that maybe they needed a break. And then a couple weeks later, after Sundays of worship and eating and playing games and enjoying people's company, she acknowledged something she didn't want to acknowledge, but that was true. There was something about gathering with believers, focusing on God that lifted her spirit. See, along the nearly 2,000 miles of their trip, when they arrived, not behind schedule, but ahead of schedule, losing 250 oxen and arriving as friends, she learned an important lesson on that trip. She learned the power of magnificent defeat. See, her story reminds me of a, a guy in Scripture. His name is Jacob. And, and Jacob's kind of a troublemaker. Jacob's got some, some attitude. Jacob's got some issues and Jacob, I mean, really, we could call him what he is. He lived as a con man for a while, a liar at different periods of his life. He stole his brother's birthright for a bowl of soup. He took his brother's blessing with a Halloween outfit and hairy arms. His brother was a hairy dude. He took that. And you can read in the book of Genesis, from even birth, he's wrestling with his twin brother Esau, trying to pull him back from the womb, all the way to a looming reunion later on in Genesis. And in between, the liar gets lied to. The con man gets conned. He wanted Rachel, and he gets Leah instead, and then he gets both. Jeff asked if we were married. Man, try to be married twice at the same time. Hey, your wife's right next to you. Watch it. Now, you were nodding. You're like, yeah, give me a second wife. I saw it. <laughs> but here's what's neat in Genesis after 32, Jacob's going to start as he prepares for this reunion with his brother after two decades of not seeing each other, after hearing that Esau has 400 men, his own private army that's going to be meeting them on the road, Jacob has a decision to make. And we find that this, this beautiful crossroads that we all come to. For Jacob, he goes like this, from a guy who had stolen blessings to finally deciding to hold on to the blessing. Here's how it starts. 
That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he set all of his possessions. And so you start to see what's going on here. Jacob has all of these different clusters of his things. He hopes that these clusters, if one is attacked, the rest can flee. He hopes that some of these gifts that he gives will cover up some of the corruption of his past. And even the physical barrier, the Javik, will be this defense. If he needs to run, he can get out of Dodge. But then out of nowhere, all alone, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, no doubt, this is a foggy episode. In verses 24 and 25, the wrestler is called a man. But in verse 30, we find Jacob announces that he's wrestled with Elohim, the supreme God, and he hasn't died. He's shocked. See, Jacob brings into this moment as the byproduct of his own misdeeds wrestling. He's wrestled with the past. He's wrestled with his problems. He's wrestled with different roads to take. He's wrestled with the phantoms of what might be or what could happen. He wrestled just like you wrestle. Right? Haven't there been times in your life where you've been at a crossroads and you said, what do I do? I could do A, or I could do B, or I could do Z, and you just keep wrestling, and you try to sleep, and you twist and turn like you're doing calisthenics in the bed, or Pilates or something, just trying to burn some calories. We wrestle. And Jacob has lived a life wrestling. He's tried to put his problems into headlocks and full Nelson. But the crossroads and the transformation comes when Jacob finally decides he's done wrestling with the phantom and he starts wrestling with the blesser. When God appears, this man God before him. High school teacher Gordon Dalby had an experience that brought this to life. He was in Mexico for the summer studying his Spanish. And while he was there, he sat across this small rickety table from this older man named Manuel who was there to help him practice his Spanish lesson. And Emel was, was gray-haired, but broad-shouldered, sturdy fellow. And he had announced early in the conversation that he used to be a boxer. That was my boxing move. I saw you. I know you were scared. Don't worry. You're safe. I'm not a boxer. And Manuel kind of shared that, and they got into the Spanish lesson when all of a sudden Manuel put both of his elbows on the middle of the table. And he gave the universal sign. <laughs> Right? He kind of grunted, right? What does this mean? Yeah, got a couple people. Yeah, he wanted to arm wrestle. And Gordon was trying to find the right words to decline an arm wrestling in a different language, and he couldn't do it. And so finally, he relented. Manuel was ready, and they clasped hands, and they started the wooden table shaking, and the, the glasses trembling, and Gordon, the sweat forming on his forehead, and his hand is getting closer and closer. And finally, he goes down. He's been defeated. And Manuel stands up, one bicep bulging. And he says, I used to be a boxer, but now I like to wrestle. He said, I love wrestling. I don't want to stay far back. I want to get my finger on the flesh and all the way my touch to the bone. My finger to the flesh and my touch to the bone. See, Manuel, more than just his, his wrestling strategy, actually lays out the nature of our God. See, the beauty of our God is that although he's eternal, although he's transcendent, our God becomes imminent. Our God comes close. Our God decides that standing far off when you need him isn't an option, and so he draws close, and so he can get a finger to your flesh, and he can get a touch to the bone by taking on our humanity. And Jesus, here's, here's the beautiful part. This man, God, in our story, he comes to Jacob in the midst of his controversy and conflict and challenge, just like Jesus comes in the midst of our challenges and conflict and uncertainty. And the reason why is because that's the place where our character can most be practiced. Right? Or I think back to those moments in your life when you've been most uncertain is the time where you're most open for guidance, when you're most open for someone to speak into your moment, where you're most open for someone to say something that gives you direction. And here's the beauty of this, is that if you have a God who's willing to wrestle with you to craft your character, it means you also have a God who's willing to wrestle for you 
as you go about your journey. See, Jacob finds this man God will wrestle with him, but he's about to find that as he's dragged in his old life to this moment, he needs a new name. Take a listen. Verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was wrenched as he wrestled with him. See, maybe you're more comfortable with touched by an angel rather than WWE God. But what I want to challenge you with is I want you to be okay wrestling with God when he needs you. See, we as a church, we as individuals walking in this journey of faith, we have to start being willing to wrestle with God. A God who says, man, when you're wrestling at night trying to figure out what to do, come to me. In your success, wrestle with me for humility. In your defeats, wrestle with me for your identity. In your worries, wrestle with me so that you can see that I'm your warrior. Wrestle. It's what Joshua tells his people. He says, have I not told you, commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. And he could have added in there, because your God knows how to wrestle. And you look at God as he comes into human flesh through Jesus, and he wrestles through separation from the Father, as demonic attacks, and human flesh, and its uncertainty. See, when you wonder where God is in your struggle, remember the God who will wrestle with you is the God who wrestles for you. And so as he wrestles with this man, the man finally says, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but is because you struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. But let's remember who Jacob is. He's in the line of Abraham and Isaac, part of that blessing to reach the whole world, to bless every family on earth. And the problem is that Jacob has gotten some of his grandma Sarah's craftiness, some of his father Isaac's uh, uncertainty, and he's lived out his own name, Jacob. It means heel grabber. You know any heel grabbers in your life? You know any? Hill grabbers, man. Jacob lived his life trying to supplant people or circumvent people or overreach where he was. What a great nickname, man. He's the heel grabber. And God asked him his name, not because he doesn't know it, but because he's about to change it. So Jacob comes to the one episode where he can't outwit, outfox, or outmaneuver his opponent. All he can do is hold on. And the beauty of this moment for me is that he comes to this man, God, who with one touch is powerful enough to disable him. One touch. He makes his lower body, his whole leg, just stop working. But this man, God, is willing to lose this wrestling match so that Jacob can win a blessing. See, he gets a glimpse at the gospel. See, that our God was willing to come and experience a magnificent defeat so that we could find victory that our God was willing to be lost into sin and take it upon himself so that we wouldn't be lost. See, our God changes people's name when he's about to change their life. A new name equals a, a new journey. Abraham gets a new name. Sarah gets a new name. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. And at the threshold of the Jabbok, Jacob becomes Israel meaning wrestles with God. Now everyone, some call us out, hey, hey, Israel! Hey, Israel, can you pass me that cup? Hey, Israel, where are we going? Every time someone calls his new name, he's meant to remember the gospel message for him and for us, that he has a God who would lose the match so that he could win. A God who would take on the magnificent defeat of a cross so that we were crossed off in the book of life. And here's the cool thing. A new name isn't just promise to Jacob, it's promise to each of us. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said this. He said, to everyone, to everyone, to everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden man. I'll provide for you. I'll give you a white stone 
And on that stone, I'm going to write your new name that no one knows but the one who received it. Now, here's what's cool. The white stone in the first century was the sign of a jury acquitting a person on trial. Did you see the gospel there? That our God, man, will come and take the cross and take on all our guilt and give us the white stone with a new name despite our guilt. That Jesus comes and he says, listen, I'm going to give you a new life and a new name and a new journey in me. Because every old life needs a new name. Reminds me of the the crossover of an NFL Hall of Famer by the name of Mike Singletary. Anyone familiar? Yeah, he used to coach the 49ers for a couple years, not our best years. Kind of some rough years in there, but great player. Won the Super Bowl. And the reporters during press conferences started to notice that he always wore this wooden cross. And they asked him, hey, have you always worn the cross? And he said, no, no, I, I started wearing it after we won the Super Bowl. And they're like, why did, why did you start wearing it after you won the Super Bowl? And he said, because... After winning, I feel I realized that there was nothing there for me. He said, I had put the wrong ladder against the wrong house, and I climbed to the highest point, and I found that there was nothing there. I think at times, Jacob's story is Mike's story, is our story. If you've lived long enough, you've probably grabbed more than one ladder, and you put it against the wrong house, and you've tried to climb to the highest peaks of it, trying not to fall, and you've looked out, and you said, where is something that will fill me up? Where is something that will satisfy me? Where is enough? And yet, I think back again and again, why would eternal beings be satisfied with temporary things for very long? The whole time, we've needed to cross over. We needed our old lives to meet our new name in Jesus, an eternal God who comes and meets the needs of temporary flesh and eternal beings. He said, I put the wrong ladder against the wrong house. He found there was nothing there. Jacob has moved more than one ladder, and he's put him against the wrong house again and again. And finally, he brings his old life not to the right place, not to the right plan. He's brought it to the right person, and the person of Jesus for us is the place where we find our hope. Where Jesus is going to be pinned to a cross, not by Roman nails, but by his love. Where Jesus is going to be pummeled with names and insults so that we can finally hear our new name, our priceless name. See, the story of Jacob resonates with me in, in my wrestlings, probably hopefully in your wrestlings. But here's Jacob. Here's how this story ends. Jacob goes from a runner to a man who has to be a limping leader. Verse 29. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it was because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. His descendants would always kind of remember this by not eating that part of animals near the tent. See, here Jacob is brought to a critical and crucial turning point. He's at the threshold of Cana. He's going through what experiencing God calls the crisis of faith. The crisis of faith or the crisis of belief means that God has called us. God has invited us into his work. But in order to be part of that work, it means we have to adjust our lives to God's calling. And so as we adjust, as we go through that crisis, God invites us further down the path. See, for Jacob, that means the running's over. I mean, this guy could have been in Nike commercials. He could have been on the Olympic track team. This guy knew how to run. He ran from his brother. He ran from his father-in-law. He wants to run from this army if he knew where to go. He's a runner. And yet in this moment, there's no place for him to run. And now with the God-man having touched him, he has to limp for the rest of his life. And I've read enough leadership books to know most of the time their advice is this. Use your strengths, hire for your weaknesses. Use your strengths, Try not to let anyone see your weaknesses. See, but they forget that our God leverages weakness. 
It's been said by one person, God can't use you unless you're broken. I think God's hiring process would look a lot different than when we go to a job interview and we wear our three-piece suits or whatever and we have our polished, scented resume. I didn't know that scented you can scratch and sniff and everything. It's beautiful. I think God kind of does his version of a field sobriety test. He says, okay, get out of what you're used to and I want you just to start walking. And God starts walking, and he's not looking to see if you can walk on the straight line. I couldn't do it sober. I mean, I don't know if straight just isn't my thing. I just, it's hard for me. I'm just tall. But God says, as you walk, all I'm looking for is, are you a limping person? Are you a limping Christian? Are you a limping pastor? Are you a limping volunteer? Are you a limping parent? Are you a limping Sunday school teacher? Are you limping or not? See, the person who's wrestled long enough with God starts to limp. They've wrestled long enough that they've called out, God, what's your name? And they've gotten something far better. They've gotten to know God for themselves. Did you know I've only been able to stand up here the last seven years because I've had a limp? Our elders have only been able to guide this church because, man, they're limping. Everything we've done is because and we found not our strength or our education or our insight, but because we have a God who was defeated to give us life. So you don't think God will use you only because of your successes or your strengths. No, but he'll use you not to spite your weaknesses, but through your weaknesses. This sometimes looks like one of my good friends, Leaf. He told me I could share his testimony. He told me if I invited him up here after, he'll kill me. <coughs> Said, do not make me speak. But his testimony was real. He was struggling in the midst of alcoholism, and he would go between two poles. He would try to be strong enough to fight his addiction alone one second, and then the next, he would stop fighting altogether. He would wake up in the middle of the night and go outside to his vehicle and get those little bottles that he hid under his gas lid just to get through a few more hours. I remember standing with him and his wife in the driveway one night as he argued with us that he could do this, that he could be strong enough, that he could get through this, that if he just worked a little bit harder, that he'd find a way. But that was the night where he finally heard for the first time that it broke through, that if he didn't surrender, if he wasn't defeated, he was going to lose everything. That night was the magnificent defeat he went into a 30-day facility treatment. And on the other side, as we sat down for a cup of coffee, as he was clear-headed and calm, he said, all along, I thought I had to be strong enough. But I realized that all along, I had been trying to play God. And as he wrestled with God during those days, as he held on, as he refused to let go, no doubt, Liz has a limp. But the beauty is our God uses every limp as an invitation or as license to be worked through. A magnificent defeat that opens the door for others' victory. See, the coolest thing is that Leaf now, as he's wrestled through this, as he's holding on to God, is preparing to open the door to celebrate recovery. It's a Christian-based AA program in our area. See, Leaf's testimony, as I hope our church's testimony, See, my prayer for Walnut Grove is that this would always be a hospital for the hurting. That this would always be a wrestling mat for those who are seeking God. That this would be a launching pad for people who are limping to have license for God to work through them. That this would be a place where we could call each other by our new name often enough. That it starts to sound right. See, Jacob's story, man, he is he fearing the worst defeat of his life ends like this. Genesis 33, verse 3, he himself went ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. See, for the first time, he, he bows down. He lived an entire life trying to stand up, trying to never be defeated. About him seven times, scholars think, is the sign of a, of a servant honoring their master. And so he bows down and he honors the one he had wronged. He comes limping and tired 
and beat down. But for the first time in his weakness, he finds that Esau runs up to him. They embrace each other. He throws his arms around him. They kiss and they weep together. See, today my prayer for you is that you would experience the magnificence of peace. What can only come when you see that Jesus Christ has laid down everything for you, poured out his entire identity for you, so that you and your defeat could be in the place at the cross to pick it up. Leif, as we talked about his testimony, left me with one thought. He said, Stephen, the best thing I've ever done was be defeated. The best thing I've ever done was be defeated. See, today, may the same thing be said about us. May the best thing we've ever done is just be defeated so that our God can be victorious through us. What I want to do is I want to pray for you. I want to pray for this congregation. I want to pray that God would use you in your strength, but also that you give him permission to use your weakest areas, your most vulnerable areas, that you would start to limp. And not have to hide that or try to make sure no one sees, but man, limp proudly. Because God uses the limping leaders to do ministry. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you uh, for, for Leap and his willingness for his story to be told. You tell us that, man, we are saved by the blood of the, the Lamb and by the testimony of the saints. So Lord, I pray that that story of weakness, that the story of brokenness that Leaf experienced, Lord, would touch the broken parts inside of us. And Lord, that you would help us to live boldly enough that we wouldn't try to act whole when the world knows we're not. But Lord, instead that you would allow us to come to our brokenness and bow down before you to wrestle with you. And then to trust, Lord, that you're the God who's always wrestled for us. So Lord, I pray for the people here today who bring in their their quiet struggles that they haven't told anyone about. Lord, I pray for the people who are barely hanging on and they don't know, Lord, if their, their arms can hold out much longer. But Lord, we know you're also the God holding on to them, holding on to us. Thank you for meeting us in our, our worst moments, in our darkest places, in the dark soul, dark, dark night of our soul. And Lord, thank you for being the God-man that was defeated so we could be victorious. Lord, help us to hang on to the gospel. Help us to be a people defined by that gospel. And Lord, allow us to find your strength is enough. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.